it, it, it'll be fine. Hello all, Slightly Slanted Sleuths coming at you with Dr. Richard Allen Miller. Dr. Richard Allen Miller is a plethora of knowledge and uh, a storehouse of <laughs> a storehouse of uh, knowledge that we we uh, definitely want to hear from. And Richard, why don't you tell us a little about, a bit about yourself? Okay, um, I'm 74 years old. I'm a grumpy old man. Uh, originally, when I came out of grad school, well, let's start in high school. Uh, old man Dupont uh, was at my high school graduation because I had I was the first American to create particles going faster than speed of light. And those experiments uh, were used on the Mariner 4 in 64. I, by the way, I did that in 1960. I had a linear accelerator in high school and was one of those kind of kids. And then he uh, was at my uh, undergraduate uh, 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 at, at, in college uh, called uh, at Washington State University. I had, uh, uh, graduated with a degree in physics. My undergraduate thesis, I had an undergraduate thesis where I built the first plasma jet. He hired me. I went back east to work in the experimental research station in, in Wilmington. Ended up, uh, he sent me to graduate school. And when I came out of graduate school, that's when it all, the historical part of my career began. Uh, first, uh, setting up Navy SEAL program in 1967. Um, I, I started the SEAL program. They found me in anesthesiology at the UW, and, uh, and then uh, I, I was SEAL Team 1, uh, and then uh, trained doing 3, and then moved to the Pentagon under Dr. Carl Schleicher, the smoking man. I was uh, Northwest Regional Director of MRU, and for the next six years, ran everything in the areas of paranormal studies on the West Coast. I had one tour at Broom Lake, and, uh, Area 51, and met Krill. I've done uh, alien studies uh, at the University of Chicago uh, 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 with uh, what appeared to be uh, UFO fragments. That's an interesting story. That was written up in, in um, Zoom, uh, what is it? Um, I forget the magazine now, It's uh, it was, uh, uh, I have the article, it's called The Modern Alchemist, and it was uh, a zine on the internet. I started writing for, uh, uh, when I figured out what I was doing, I got pretty upset at what I was becoming. So I left the military and went for the next 35 years, went into farming. I'm basically your MacGyver for the military. I currently uh, do sustainable lifeboats uh, with Matt Stein. And um, I'm doing a workshop this weekend on ESP induction through forms of self-hypnosis. That's uh, how to think with the gut, survival training. Right. Okay, I, got, well, I mean, there's a that, lot that more, in, but that's, you know, uh, what most people think are the important highlights in my life. There's other things. Of course, I was a Boy Scout, made Eagle, <laughs> you know, and I'm a, basically a polymath. Uh, because I, I'm ba what I am, I have an eidetic memory. And um, so I, I'm like, basically, I like a four-year-old that has never become seven. And now I'm <laughs> 74. What would you like to know? I pretty much know. I don't know. But, I mean, if you wanted to talk about Michael Raja, I'm your huckleberry. <laughs> well, what, what was the most, what's the most meaningful thing that, you think you are as 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 it uh, concerns you uh, and what your contribution uh, is i'm practical i'm practical. very practical <laughs> I, you know, when i say practical like farming agriculture has mostly got a lot of people in horticulture and uh, or soil sciences but i came in as a physicist and so my approach to i have like a nine volume encyclopedia of alternative agriculture. When I left the military and spent the next 35 years in agriculture, Henry Barth, who was the fifth richest man in the world, heard of my availability, flew all the way over from Nuremberg, hired me on the spot 
uh, and gave me 28 farms in four states with deep pockets. Figure out how to grow these crops, anything you want to do. And he just let me go. And I had uh, pyrethrum going on this farm, and I had uh, flax going on that farm. And, you know, I've done everything uh, pretty much in the agricultural thing. Conrad Richter, Richters of Canada, will say I'm probably the best field man in the world. If you want to put a crop in, I'm your huckleberry. I put in, I had like 28 managers in four states with deep pockets to figure out how to grow things. And so I started with hop fields and off I went, uh, you know, with perennials, annuals, whatever. Yeah, things like that. So agriculture, I think my background is in self-sustaining situations, sustainable lifeboats, lifeboats with oars, where like the city of Chattanooga hired me to come in. I did nine workshops. And at the end of that month, of a full month of doing all these different workshops and so on, that city today now grows 40% of the food they eat. The downtown Chattanooga has got 200 acre farm. That's a community garden and farmer's market with a bulletin board on what's for sale each day from each farm. And uh, all the different restaurants on the Chattanooga River are have got um, uh, greenhouses. They grow their own salad materials and things like that. That's what I'm about, is I'm basically like your MacGyver in the woods. I, I, I know how to live in the woods and have uh, written books on that, that area, you know, like uh, native plants of commercial importance, how to make a living in the forest. You know, just bartering, you know, different things from the floral trade on down to your medicinal pharmacy. Excellent. And it, when when it comes to uh, the books you've written and the knowledge that you've uh, put forth into the public uh, realm, we had I had sent you that CIA document, that leaked CIA document. That yeah, wasn't that interesting on brain drivers? I'm just yeah. marketing those right now on my website. I uh, that's from '92, by the way. Um, I started that back in the '70s. Uh, so you were part of that CIA. That document. No, that I, CIA wasn't involved with that back in the seventies. Uh, look, they had MK Ultra, and then uh -huh. after that was mind control. Yep. But, yep. But it didn't deal with brain drivers per se. Okay. Okay. Frequency following function and things like that. That was uh, um, Robert Monroe had written a book. Uh, he was at UC Berkeley. Had written a book called uh, uh, Astral Projection, and uh, uh, later that has been misnomered as remote viewing and things of that nature. But he was very interested in brain entrainment and how to train the brain and get it back into true. Over the years, that, that's one of the things I'm a big on is that children are way smarter than we are. And what happens is somewhere between the age of four and seven, our brains get confabulated into Believing that time is real, uh, where a child doesn't have that thing, I don't. Um, and, and so what I'm doing today is trying to determine what the next evolutionary stage is in man's evolution and consciousness. I'm on it. Uh, my mentor, Sir uh, uh, Dr. Stanley Krippner, would say that I'm 20 years ahead of the curve and that I'm always dead on. I just I think I would, I would agree with that. <laughs> no, no, I, I always had an instinct. If I didn't know something and I'd had to make a decision, do I go right or left? I instinctively knew which way the sciences would go. I just knew it. I don't know how to explain that other than I'm really good as a scientist. My education in that field is exemplary. I, I really have been blessed. I've had more than 12 Nobel Prize winners that I have physically studied under, including Roger, Sir Roger Penrose and uh, Albert Sense Gorky and uh, Dr. Charlie Muses. And uh, mm -hmm. I've had tremendous education. And so with that, I, I studied with James Elman and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, though my background in Jungian psychotherapy is exemplary. I'm not a Jungian. I'm a third generation imaginalist. 
psychology. I find that very useful with my physics. Yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, I, 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 wish I, I wish I was as far ahead of the curve as you. I, I'm still an, uh, a low-level initiate in this whole esoteric Stop game. That. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, what I want to ask you is, do you believe that our reality is projected through our collective uh, uh, sense of reality? You know what I mean? <laughs> you mean consciousness? Consciousness is not real. The illusion of reality. I, I can prove to you that what we're experiencing right now isn't real. However, uh, there are more of what I would consider advanced races like the Hopi and the Aborigines that would actually suggest that uh, there are dream states that have more content to reality than, uh, than consciousness. We in consciousness focus on things rather than emotions. Mm -hmm. How you feel about something is what it's all about. And that's the law of attraction. If you feel good, you will bring goodness into you. If uh, it isn't what you want, it's what you feel. Uh, mm -hmm. It defines who you are. That's a new Batman. I'll do it that way. You are no longer, uh, you're, you are defined by uh, what you do, not who you are. Well, I would say you are defined by what you feel not what you do and so spirituality is not what you do but the quality in which you go about your personal belief and so religions and science two brains science and religion like is a closed system and uh it says my internet connection is unstable why would that do that to me i have no Just clue to mess me up yeah, you got a little sign going on. Yeah, you're kind. Yeah. You're kind of. Uh, you're, just record it for posterity. <laughs> you know, after I'm warm food. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you're. I right. feel. Yeah, I feel that consciousness is not what we think it is, and that this is like they, they've all suggested we're in a matrix. Um, that is not untrue and uh by looking at certain ways universes uh certain doors are open and others are closed uh originally you start all scientific exploration with assumed truths and then definitions before you even start to do theorem postulates axioms mm -hmm. and so on and, and so, okay so the shortest distance between two points is a straight line mm -hmm. now that led to a certain kind of set of parameters, what we call quantum universes, you know. But then entered Heisenberg with the idea that the more you know about one thing, the less you know about something else. That means that when you go from an analog. That's my phone. Oh. <laughs> all right, yeah, we've got interruptions, that's all. They can spy the gods. Can spy. Right, right. <laughs> okay, that's a good segue into what I, the question I have for you now is, do you believe in there's a, uh, maybe an archonic force that has entrapped, like you said, emotion, and in in emotion is energy motion, you know, do you believe that they are harvesting, or not they, but some forces kind of uh, trapped us for energy fuel of some sort? Or okay, so uh, there was a science fiction story called uh, Liquid Sky. I'm into rare sci-fi, you know, campy things with uh, 3,000. Yeah, uh, okay, I like campy old movies. And Liquid Sky is about a group of aliens that live under the underweaves of shooting galleries because they were interested in the adrenaline that is involved, no adrenaline and serotonin. Mm -hmm. um, that's a movie called Liquid Sky that's kind of creepy. Um, yeah, that's not un, uh, unimaginable. In fact, that's Merlin that would say, uh, anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory. That means that if it's possible, you can count on it. And so our universe is uh, the multiverse, as we now define it with knot theory and uh, Kaufman's mathematics, um, is offering the idea that imagination is reality. And the imagination of our 
is limitless in some forms. I mean, anything you could, how did that uh, uh, Indiana Jones thing, anything goes? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's pretty accurate. And um, there is a, what we call a Gregor, uh, that would be the group mind, you know, believing that there's a big bad wolf out there. And right. there probably isn't. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. call it the devil. The devil didn't exist until Christ. Um, that's how the Stargates and those concepts first came in. There was a book out of the Vatican um, it called The uh, Secret Tradition of the Yazidi. And uh, it talked about demons pouring out of a door. Uh, and uh, this, it was a pre-Christian devil worshiping cult. And of course, anyone that has studied the Bible realizes that that was not possible. So right out of the gate, we knew that there were, this must be talking about an artifact of some kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in the seventies, I have a copy of the Yazidis in my, in my library. And uh, it, it's interesting because in the 70s, we knew about this, but we didn't know where to look. And it wasn't until the 80s when uh, the second Trump, uh, a second Bush went in, uh, the son, with tomography. The first, first, the father went in to Iraq and didn't know where to find it. And then the second Bush in the invasion of Iraq, uh, right out of the gate, one week after we went in, uh, he got on board that ship. And with all those metals in there, fake metals and all of that, and said, the war's over, we got it. What's that mean? We got it. We found the Stargate. It was about 60 miles down the catacombs in the northern part of Iraq. And if you and, and it was uh, the Church of Rome, the Jesuits, that wrote about it uh, in 1919. I noted that it's like in our communities today, we'll talk about things mm -hmm. and then... 20 years later, it'll be validated by a religion or a science that will start to confirm, yeah, life started on Mars, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the Golden Dawn used to talk about these kinds of things. Well, if the shortest distance between two points is no longer a straight line, that means tunneling. We have that in solid state physics with event horizons and precursor waves and and things of that nature. Well, then all of a sudden, the definitions start to change on what space is and what space is not. Right. And once you have, okay, that then sets up a whole bunch of other possibilities of the way what doors are available and what ones are closed to us. And that's why our assumed truths limit our sciences. And uh, as we find irregularities with the assumption that space is curved with specific mathematics i can prove the earth's flat but that doesn't mean it's flat the correct answer is it's both it's both and yeah you, i agree well, that's that's correct if yeah. you look at it this way it's flat and these are the only kinds of realities that are available to you, you can fall off into oblivion <laughs> Uh, I think I think wrong. that's because we're on the inside looking out, you know, and that's why we we can't see the whole picture. We can't. Well, the, the better way of expressing that too is when the minister says, "Is this house white or is it brown?" Mm -hmm. The correct answer is yes, because you can't <laughs> see the other side of the house. I you know, that. that's like God. You 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 can't know God by definition. You can experience Him absolutely. You know, His wrath and His goodness and its qualities and all of that. You can't know him. It's beyond our scope. Mm -hmm. I was watching a movie the other night with some friends called Hitchhiker's Guide, where the dolphin were the, was it? Yeah. Was what do you think the 42 is? What do you, what do you think the 42 is in, in reference well, to that? that's the wrong question. See, that <laughs> the 42 is the one for all answers, but there you go. You have a good memory. Yes, yeah, 42. But remember, it was the two mice that we're running and thanks for all the fish with the dolphin leaving and all of that. Actually, Orca has a cerebral cortex. It's twice the size of man. And that mammal is firing 60% of it. If you want to know who God is, it's not our God, but you want God, you know, that which cannot be known, be Orca. 
that mammal is better designed for its biosphere and is more in tune with its biosphere. And here's the bad news. There are four cetaceans that have bigger brain cases than men. Dolphin is number two. And I have watched Orca chase dolphin for food chain. And there you go, Bob Dylan. Everybody's got to serve somebody. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> exactly. You know. Okay, uh, now, to get back to your quote, your, uh, you, you were saying about the ever-changing uh, aspects of our physics or what we know is true. What do you th what, what's your opinion on the new uh, release about uh, CERN finding the new muon behavior and whatnot? Okay, that was my 1960 experiment. My junior year was a new uh, meson field theory, and it talks about the muon creating a tachyon factory where you beam tachyons down and watch the bending of it as they slow down hitting water. And that's how we measured the water on Mars was using muons, which are now considered an elementary particle. I did that, by the way, in 1960. And then the linear accelerator was actually in 61. And uh, it was old man DuPont that was using all, both of those experiments on the Mariner 4 in 1964. And why people have always keyed off my physics. I was a experimental physicist. Anything I touched and built worked. I built the first aortic catheter when I was in anesthesiology. I actually grew the crystals, put them on a two millimeter tip. We took some dogs and experimented going in through the femoral artery up into the aortic arch. And there it is, it worked. And that device, I built the first one of those uh, aortic catheters and is now the premier measuring tool when they take your life down near zero and hold you in stasis when they do terrible things to your body. I, uh, How exactly does that work, the crystals or what you were just talking about? Oh, um, I used a 10 megahertz Doppler transducer that would send a signal in and hit the blood and reflect back. That gave oh. me velocity. Wow. And then I drew 28 megahertz crystals on the outside, eight of them, that did a pulse echo off the aortic wall. And so the product is called cardiac output, which is aortic cross section times blood velocity. So you so simulated the, the ACASA, the ACASA that, it, that flows through us, right? Is the in the magnetic uh, medium. Well, that well, these, our body has dosimetry. Uh, that <laughs> means that different organs, different parts of the body are opaque to certain bandwidths of wavelengths. And what we're talking about in aortic catheter, megahertz uh, would hit the blood and reflect back, aortic wall uh, was opaque at 28 megahertz. And so I would do a hit the wall and reflect back. And if I had eight of them, I knew at any given moment how big the aortic wall was as the blood was moving through it. And it's the product of the two. It's called chaotic, uh, aortic uh, cardiac output. And that's like a really important measurement in medicine. Um, right. Well, it tells you how how functionally the the heart works. With the aortic cre uh, the uh, ana anesthesiologist creep, uh, blood goes round and round, air goes in and out. Anything contrary is not a good thing. Right, right. <laughs> it, so, in your opinion, what is the uh, what is the the feedback we get from an EKG? What is the mechanism that produces that? Cardiograph. Uh, okay, in an EKG, uh, that's your uh, heart rate. Uh, and uh, it's pulse echo again. And what you're doing is measuring the rate of beat. And uh, like, is it at 130? Uh, or mine right now, I could just feel I'm probably at around 150. I'm a little excited, you know, I'm hyped up a little bit. So I'm around to 150 beats a minute. Uh, normal for my age should be at 130, which means I could slow down a little bit. Oh, heart rate again. Uh, EKJ would measure that, but really, once you learn how to listen to the sounds in your body, you can change those sounds just with your mind's eye. Let me get, and you can do that with neurotransmitters like uh, dimethyltryptamine. Uh, the chill ugh, that goes up the your body. That's, that's my fuse meter. And that's Kundalini. 
Now, it turns out that that chill bleh, is actually in the visible light bandwidth. Uh, it's visible light <laughs> going up and down your spine. Got a light beam. So if you uh, can straighten your back while you're doing that chill, you're stimulating the pineal gland. The pineal gland has atrophied because its primary function, as we think it was, was to regulate the body to seasonal changes. And with artificial light and everything that we have now, uh, it's thrown that all out of whack. And so nobody's got a pineal gland that is functioning properly. And when you stimulate the pineal gland with light, mm -hmm. uh, what happens next is you set up a standing wave in the neural cavity, and now you can actually create true nerve tissue rather than glial cells, which is what you and I currently enjoy. Uh, we get over a certain age and we can't generate nerve tissue anymore because we don't have the right trace minerals and we're not stimulating the nerve production. And so what we have is a secondary nerve tissue, which is glial or surface stuff. And Robert O. Becker and I did an experiment on that because I had drop foot. I had uh, severed perineal down at my knee and uh, regenerated that in about four and a half months. That what the nerve tissue coming out of the neural cavity as it pours down the central nervous system has uh, the uh, uh, viscosity of uh, tocopherols. It's, it's real viscous, it's slow. Mm -hmm. So you bounce up and down on um, uh, you know, uh, little tiny jumping boards or whatever those, those little rubber things you jump up and down on them like that and that what that does is it the slowly the nerve the actual nerve tissue comes down to central nervous system and it takes about four and a half months to get down to the place where it's the knee it's actually is a gra by gravity and that's one of the reasons why walking and jogging and all these exercise things do more than just stress and you know weight and health they have a whole bunch of functions. And gravity is one of the problems we're gonna have when we're in space because we won't have gravity to function properly. And so that's why all your space operas will have artificial gravity. You know, they have a rotation as the things moving through space so that you have the simulation of, of gravity and things like digestion and blood flow and things of that nature are brought back into, you know, some kind of- That, le that leads me to another uh, a big question I've always had, and I, I'm sure you have an answer for this. Okay, gravity. If gravity is caused by the rotation of the Earth, you know, we're rotating at a thousand miles an hour, right? And, and that is the, the thing that creates gravity. Why don't I get thrown off a merry-go-round when I go two miles an hour? Or why do I get thrown off a merry-go-round when I go two miles an hour in a circle? And, and well, I, you have, uh, you have, uh, centripetal forces and then you have uh to, to hold you back actually uh people do get flung off of earth <laughs> <laughs> well i mean you know especially when you leap over a cliff um right. and uh and you don't really hit here you hit way over there oh okay depends on how far you fall right because right. there's all right. sorts of physics going on and actually uh the new laws say that there's no such thing as gravity the earth sucks so there it is. I, you know, <laughs> that was well, I, you know I mean, it's all a question of assumed truths uh -huh. and what you believe and the way you choose to look at something. Right. And once you choose that, it sets up its limitations. Yeah, it's all in your mind. And if you ain't got a mind, it don't matter. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, really. <laughs> suck, suck, suck. <laughs> suck, suck, suck. But uh, recently, I've been following this uh, knowledge. I've I found that. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of Nassim Harriman, but he has. Know, he's been to my home actually before he really? moved to Hawaii. I know knew his brother uh, way better than him. I've met uh, Harriman, uh, but uh, I don't know him. I, okay. I've met him, but don't know him. I know of him and his work, and I knew his brother better, just like I knew McKenna's. I knew the brother. Well, wow, would I love to be a fly on the wall in 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 your home when you two got together? <laughs> uh, Harriman. Uh, is um, he's not a physicist like I am. There's differences. Right. The rigor part of mathematics mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, a good physicist 
was uh, Alex Cavarina. Matty Pitkin and his student is okay and is out there doing stuff. But Alex Cavarinan was the one that did the original uh, studies on uh, on uh, structured water for Jerry Pollock and others. Uh, Alex Cavarinan was uh, there was someone I respected. Robert O. Becker, uh, another one I did work with and had the opportunity to work with me. I have met different levels of physics. Um, intuition aside, you know, Patrick Flanagan was a very interesting person. When I, in the 70s, when we, we started looking at razor blades being sharpened in pyramids, remember that? Pat Flanagan and, and food being preserved. One of the, I had a couple of grad students at the UW do a uh, master's under me in that regard. And we discovered that the sharpening of razor blades had to do with green migration. It is not a function of pyramids, however, what did show up was orgon, that if you do a pyramid in dissimilar materials, uh, organic, inorganic, organic, inorganic, organic, inorganic, and you have maybe 15 layers, the food will not rot 10 times slower. Wow. I have no explanation on how that works. Wow. So you pyramid power is real. I'm sorry? Pyramid power is real. Uh, that aspect of it is, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah that, uh, that's what I did for the military. I went out and vetted what was, you know, worthy of further study and what was not. Mm -hmm. And I caught a lot of flies. You know, I'm out there. <laughs> well, I've seen things that I have no idea how that works. Right. One of them is the planet Uranus. Um, when the planet, this will be in my... Uh, Spook Central book, the work I did for Dr. Carl Schleicher. Uh, the Department of Interior uh, had me do a study on cosmobiology. This is a, a, a field of science not dissimilar to astronomy or astrology, but it had to, Yana. Yana had discovered that when a woman is born, it sets the ovulation pattern in the phase of the moon where she's born. And if she moves to a different part of the earth, the ovulation pattern changes. That means there was a one sigma error coefficient on when you're born and where to when you ovulate. And that was being used as a, in Prague uh, as a, um, a birth control, a form of valid birth control that worked pretty efficiently. Uh, what came out of my studies was that when the planet Uranus is in a certain geometric alignment with Earth and the Sun, there was a three sigma. That means a 99.99975% probability of a major earthquake occurring. Now, Uranus is so far away, we have no known energies or fields that would allow Uranus to have that kind of an effect on Earth like we would like solar winds, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. So how does that work? Well, it was to suggest that space and planets aren't what you think they are, and that the storm on Jupiter could be related to a, oh, I don't know, a thought form happening in times of uh, the body of man, and that we are creating the universe around us that we call space and time based on the egregor of group consciousness. And that was interesting. And uh, the Department of Interior still uses cosmobiology and Uranus as a mark for measuring earthquakes on Earth. Even though we don't know how it works, statistically, there it is. And you can count on it when it's in that alignment. This is going to happen, and I don't know how that works. That's the Vedas. The Veda is Vedic astrology. It pretty much well, it, like alchemy becoming chemistry, and mm -hmm. now physics becoming magic. The study of altered states, altered states of consciousness. I'm going to be doing a workshop this weekend here in Grants Pass on ESP, and there's an altered state. I'm going to point at you so you get the idea that it, this is where you are, and mm -hmm. it's right there. 
right here in a state of hypnosis, your ability in guessing is 400 times where you are right now. And if you can go into that state of, uh, of consciousness under fire, you know, bullets wheezing, you won't get shot. Hmm. You, can, you, 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 you can absolutely determine the correct thing to do. And if you do get shot, it's because you were supposed to take the bullet for the team. That you know, what, of, what you just said right there explains several instances in my life where I've I've made it through certain events that I couldn't explain how I did. How it worked. You know. But that's your higher self running the show. It knows. Now, what that is, is a first brain in the stomach or gut called the enteric nervous system. And really what it is, it's a hierarchy of uh, viruses and bacteria leading up to very small organisms and yeasts and molds. And, and it's a hierarchy of consciousness and we look at the soil as Gaia you know the mycorrhizae the uh, the mycelium in the soil and its relationship to organisms like thrip and nematode and so on there's a woman up in UBC in forestry that talks about the mother tree very similar to the movie Avatar mm -hmm. where the oldest tree in the forest will send a signal out when an earthquake, uh, a forest fire, or a storm is impending to somehow notify and warn the smaller trees for lockdown. And that's essentially what your gut does. And that is essentially your role in the scheme of hierarchy on the planet Earth. You know, you're just one little part of the resonant cavity oscillation as a way of looking at things so that would be the microcosm of like the symphony of the spheres that yeah that, that's hermes and the cavalian and all the rest of those metaphysics sorry that's paul foster case that's where they went from a quantum universe to a holographic one where instead of talking about space and time your measurements are now made on information and resolution of information and that's why i said it's important you know, we talk about IQ, the physical plane, and right above it is EQ, how you feel about the physical plane. And that's got more information and why women and their so-called intuition is valid. I mean, you know, you have to give it honor. Right. It's, uh, I, I don't know what that all means other than it's your yardstick, what you're going to use to make your measurements to, for reproducibility and repeatability. And isolating the variables is not that simple. And that's called a holographic system, where you have n dimensions of information in n minus one dimensions. And so your brain, the upper brain here, is basically an amorphous semiconductor. It's a liquid crystal. And so it's constantly going through a physiological change. At any given moment, it's changing. And that means you could properly define that as a four-dimensional hologram of five space well then that means that if you could learn how to go to different places in the brain you could change the movie and guess what that's what we're discovering now when i watch a woman rip a car door off to save her daughter in a flaming automobile and i you know we've all seen something like that that's impossible the bone in her body it cannot be as strong as the steel. How could she do that? Well, they go, oh, it's adrenaline. Well, adrenaline didn't make the bone stronger. What exactly is the adrenaline doing? Well, it's changing her consciousness. And these different states of consciousness is uh, creating universes where the laws are different. And... Uh, Statistical inference is consciousness, you know, where it's this and that, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're a clunk. And if you go over here, now you can win a lottery. Uh, so what is the one to the other? Mm -hmm. Well, I think altered states of consciousness are going to become tools in a toolbox in the next stage of evolution in man's consciousness. And magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. 
the Jesuits do it with whips. <laughs> yeah, they whip themselves into a frenzy. Yeah, that's uh, true. Some of your friends do it with ayahuasca, you know, get high, <laughs> and then have an experience that allows them to do something they could not do in a normal conscious state, religious experience. And today, what we're going to find is the new direction in, uh, in medicine is going to include spiritual healing, where we're using pharmaceutical mushrooms and psychedelic mushrooms to heal the spiritual part of ourselves, which has a metaphor down into the physical plane. Yeah, that's probably where it all propagates from, right? Is, is your well-being and your emotional state and who you think you are? So, and the message I could do today that I'd like to stress is that it's not what you think about something, it's what you feel that's gonna make the difference. And it's about feelings. That's what dream states are about as well. And uh, Stephen Kaplan Williams, others have talked about lucid dreaming and the S Jungian Senoi dream manual techniques on how to access the states of consciousness that contain more content of reality than than your waking state does what's your take on tesla and his his ability to go to bed with or go to sleep with a question in his mind and for it to be answered and it being the right answer when he woke up uh of course sleeping on something allows other parts of your mind to work on problems that consciousness cannot that's why daydreaming and a children's way way more powerful in being able to solve a problem you know a two-year-old comes out of the birth right out of the gate wanting to work in a sandbox that means that earth and a garden is probably where that child should start learning reality and so and what you said what you said you said something about uh uh, at the age of six or seven, your paradigm shifts. Now, when I was five, six, I can remember back to when I was three or four or five or six, I used to have these spectacular color geometric dreams that I couldn't explain, and they, they induce fear in me. But now I know, I think I know what they were. Did, did, have you ever heard of anything like that? Or Oh, sure. The boogeyman under the bed. Is it real? How could it not be? <laughs> right. You know, there are boogeymen. How about the distinction between a ghost and a poltergeist? A poltergeist, I've done those studies for the military. <clears throat> a ghost is kind of like a thought that gets locked into matter, kind of like an infrared signal gets locked in a pane of glass, and we can go look at that infrared signature and get an accurate picture of the bank robber. Um, at some point, that infrared pattern starts to deteriorate because that universe contains uh, larva, <laughs> worms, uh, uh, cooties, uh, uh, psychic cooties, that will break down a ghost where it becomes less human. And then it becomes poltergeist. They're here. You know, um, how could a thought form in a given room of change because of what's going on inside that room. When you think you're actually pushing against the membrane and pushing psyche into matter. And the way we do that today, we have words for that in other cultures from Oregon, uh, Piranha, Chi. It's had many names, but really what it is, is structured water inside a microtubule on the surface of your skin. The Ne Jing is very clear about that. When I was in anesthesiology, we were doing the studies under President Nixon on acupuncture at the University of Washington and made discoveries way before Hameroff was even out of high school, uh, working with the concept of a microtubule, a protein, that a very narrow protein, that has structured water inside it. At the moment of death, there is a five gram weight loss in everybody. Mm -hmm. At the last sigh, something happens. Something leaves the body. Is that the soul? Uh, and do we now have a possible 
physical analog of how to measure the soul. It's five grams. Um, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is I worked in 1970 under Jerry Pollack. Uh, he was my lead. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, he was not my boss. Uh, he was my lead. That means he, when I needed a Bridgeport mill, he'd find one on campus for me so I could make my, my little, you know, cardiac output thing. Um, I feel that we are only just now opening the universe to new concepts and water, H2O, uh, is the first element and the sixth element in the first molecule that forms a dipole moment. Helium doesn't have, helium is rather un uninteresting, you know, it's H He2, and yet water, H2O, has got a dipole moment. And there's, it either goes levorotary, so you've got para or ortho water right out of the gate. Then you have isotopes, the deuterium, the ocean, down near Antarctica is almost pure deuterium. That's where they mine it. And uh, it's, uh, and then we have different other kinds of water. What is deuterium? What does deuterium get you? What is it? What deuterium is Deuterium and tritium are isotopes where they have uh, extra protein. Protons. Oh, okay. Okay. They both are radioactive. Well, de deuterium uh, makes a, uh, uh, is a, is a, tritium is used now in hydrogen bombs. Mm. Okay, that's okay. That's how you get the big explosion. It's tritium. It's very unstable and boom. Um, but we use plutonium and some of its isotopes as well. But uh, what I guess I'm trying to say is that water has a tendency. Whenever water touches anything, it immediately sets up a schism, and because it's so small that even though you say that the human body only has 70% water, it encompasses 99% because of how many different molecules are in your body and in water compared to, oh, I don't know, skin or whatever. You know, skin, how much water is in the skin? And so while water is only 70% human, it's 99% of you is made up of water. So you're saying you're pretty much postulating that maybe our consciousness is, comes from water and everything that we are comes from water? Or? No, I'm saying that that's the first resonant cavity oscillator. I <laughs> got you. Probably more complex mm -hmm. uh, di dipole moments, you know, bigger molecules like, uh, right. oh, I don't, yeah, copper and mm -hmm. gold, monoatomic, colloidal silver. And the way colloidal silver is different than silver in terms of, working as an antioxidant. When you take carbon, carbon is one of the few elements that bonds to itself, which means you can have monoatomic sheets of carbon, you know, they're just flat, one molecule thick, going off forever. But if there's only 60 carbon atoms, it will click, form a ball. You can have another ball at 120. That's why they call it C60 and C120, because the bonding out element or, or uh, angle of the molecule allows it to bond to itself and form a ball. Now, look at the little space that I've got there. It turns out that this space right here, this one right here, is 1.4 nanometers, precisely just a bit larger than a single molecule of water going inside it. That means you have a carbon atom, a carbon buckyball, and you can put a single water inside it. Now, when water touches anything, it restructures the water with memory. And then the buckyball, that means the water is completely surrounded on all sides, which means now you have uh, a fullerene, uh, that's what's called fullerene water, uh, that will go in and act as an antioxidant for radiation sickness. You know, you got a little uh, pinball with a clang, 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 clang. And as it's clicking, it, it, everything it's hitting, it's causing it to cancer. And the, uh, the fullerene will go in and isolate it. It'll surround it and so that it is no longer. And the Ukrainians and then later the Russians proved 
that you could give lethal doses of radiation to rats, feed it fullerene waters, and there was a 99% recovery. That's incredible. Um, well, yeah. Now, now, what does that suggest? We don't know yet. I mean, we're just now opening doors of study that are so exciting that this is a very cool time to be. I mean, uh, you know, the end of days, you know, you're right here for, how did he put it in, in uh, Armageddon? I'm going to sit here and have a front row seat to the embrace the horror. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say, I I say if it, like everybody in the Nibiru community, you know, I was part of it. I am part of it. But, you know, I just say if it's coming, I'm going to, I'm going to turn around, drop trow and moon it as it's coming. <laughs> so um, there is several moons and now a planet out by Saturn that came in from the Earth cloud. Where did it come from and where's it star? Well, Nibiru is out there, out past the Earth cloud, uh, because everything is a binary, just like your brain is, as a way of looking at things, shortest distance. And so you can see into the out of. And if you have a white hole, a black hole, where's the other side of it? It's a white hole, right? Right. Uh, what do you think dark matter might be? I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, we're just now starting to open it. You know, it's interesting. They, the science the news, one of the things, had this picture of space, and you could move the cursor this way or that way, and it would show you real particles. And if you moved it here, then it would be dark matter, you know, moving it back and forth. And it's like a reflection. A mirror. Uh, yeah, just like your brain is. It's a closed system between science and religion. Science does not have the answers any more than religion does. In right. fact, well, it's uh, when you said right, you're making an assumed truth. And uh, that's, uh, you know, limiting what you can't. Okay, just so you're on top of that one. You, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't have believed it. That is, in fact, what this brain is about. To make all your beliefs true. It's a wonderful tool. And, you know, I'm not going to get shot. I'm going to become Superman. And off I come with Spider-Man now getting his citizenship. Rest that might explain know. some of them, uh, them uh, stelas or, or hieroglyphs in, in ancient Egypt that show the, the mirror image of, of uh, tons of people that are in the hieroglyphs. You know, you know which ones I'm talking about? Yes, I do. What's your take on those? Do you think that's something? Well, uh, listen, I, just in the last two days on face, my Facebook page, I've been posting the alternative histories of men. And, mm -hmm. you know, like Kobinki, Tepe, uh, now they're proving that that was an Aboriginal culture. Wow. And that cave that goes to Kobinki, Tepe, uh, starts in Scotland. There's underground caverns that go from Scotland all the way down into Turkey. And that was run by Aborigines, whom, in my opinion, have a better sense of reality than we do. In yeah. fact, can you talk about Hopi and Inuit for 5,000 and 7,000 years, and then you go to the Aborigines, their culture goes way back further. And now they're showing that Koblinki Tepe is, is, was Aboriginal before we came, Englishmen and all that and Australia was connected to Asia and da 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 da. It's an interest. I just posted that up on my Facebook as interesting. I don't know. I wasn't there. I can tell you that I posted something on the Civil War, and the Civil War was not about slavery. Right. I, I would agree. Okay, with well, that. how's that work in the history books? And where's Antarctica? And worse. Yeah. I what's your take on Antarctica? I'm sorry. What's your take on Antarctica? What's going on down there? Oh, uh, you mean right now? Right now. <laughs> the boogeyman woke up. I, I don't know. When I was there in the 70s, I saw uh, a destroyed Nazi base of 19 subslips. I saw, they were there they were, they were in disarray, da da da, from where a nuclear bomb had hit them. That, by the way, happened in the 60s when. Uh, What's his name? John Kennedy had had enough of what was going on, and they dropped uh, a nuclear weapon on uh, in Antarctica. And I went in there in the 70s, 
the Nazi base was ruined. I saw a Viking base from the 14th century. And where's that in our history books? No doubt. And I saw a hole in the earth, a large hole that went down 100 miles straight into the mantle. And we did not, we did not have that technology back in the 70s to go down 100 miles straight down. Um, I believe does that give, when does, at, does that give oh, hollow earth some credence then? I mean, I'm sorry? does that give the hollow earth some credence or, or Agartha? Well, I'm not going to say that part. What I am going to say is our physics, even today, would suggest that 100 miles down, that hall has got to have some kind of force field because at that level, the earth is plastic. It's so hot and so pressured that yeah. metal turns to uh, plastic and uh, what's maintaining its integrity. Um, what I have discovered, when Buzz Aldrin and others went down there, my guess is they went down, they finally had a technology that could go down that far into the earth and they found something in stasis. And when they had that huge evacuation, what was that, about a year and a half ago, I think it was? A couple years back where the scientists yeah. went missing and everything, yep. Yeah, where they had, a, I, think, I think something woke up. Probably something like, I don't know, Nephilim. Um, the giants, they're everywhere. They're, uh, I did a BBC interview a while back where in 1820, before we had UFO nonsense like that, like we do today, mm -hmm. uh, a giant skull was dug up in Pennsylvania and stuck in the Smithsonian. It subsequently went missing. It was probably dumped in the Atlantic when the two brothers that started the Smithsonian were trying to probably vet or validate their father, who was a Methodist minister, chasing, uh, who's the guy that started Joseph Smith, that started the Mormon tradition? That minister went after his flock for about 35 years trying to get his church back. And I think it was his two sons that dumped that skull in the Atlantic as a way to vet their father about UFO and aliens and Nep Nephilim and so on, which are now being discovered everywhere. The skulls coming out of Russia. Uh, and, and, well, the, don't they have a museum in Ecuador of them? Well, that is Anunnaki. That's different. That's what different. I'm talking about is a giant that might be 25 feet tall. And wow. the Anastasi, the uh, Hopi, talk about giants that were cannibals. Is that why these, uh, some of the mound, do you know anything about the Mississippi River mound builders? And I know that Cleopatra went down the Mississippi looking for copper. I know that she went down the Colorado and looking for copper. They have a place down there that they found artifacts that uh, predate uh, Egyptians with golden Buddhas. You're yeah, talking yeah. the Grand Canyon, and you're talking the shrines in the Grand Canyon they found in the cavern? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's all kinds of anomalies in our history that leave big questions to me. Yes, they do. <laughs> uh, for me, I'm going to play one on you. This is a little one I like to play. Uh, I have a friend at, at, uh, at Stanford that said, you know, the infrared IR signature on um, uh, 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 Nibiru is wrong. It, it's not actually, as a brown dwarf, its infrared signature should be different than what we're currently measuring. And um, I remember my friend from JPL saying, yeah, ha, 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 ha. it's a, probably a Dyson sphere. And uh, I then piped in, yeah, it's our future, coming back to the moment to collect the rent. And uh, <laughs> that was, yeah. Wow, well, yeah. you just gave me goosebumps. I, I know, goosebumps because I can absolutely guarantee you that man did not start here on Earth. And that Mars actually, physically, has more water than Earth does for a larger planet. And Mars has got structured water on it that if you put a volumetric ball the ball is actually bigger than the ball of water that's on earth and okay uh, you, you keep saying structured water what in 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 exactly do you mean by structured water what is structured water so we started with old man willard 
and yeah. uh, and uh, the the usual uh, Dombacher and all the rest of them that talked about water around a waterfall that invigorated you. And that was H three O nine, H three O seven with a free radical ion. H two O, it's H H three O seven. I think it, I, it's three water molecules. It's a clustered water where you have water is bonding to itself, and it falls and it gets stripped of an ion. So it has an activated ion, and the water itself is H seven O nine. It's H H seven O nine with a free radical ion. Yeah. And now, Jerry Pollock's water is hydrogen peroxide with an extra hydrogen molecule, H3O2, and is why the leading edge of a wave in, in, um, in the ocean is moving faster than the wave itself. It's because when water touches something like air, it, it actually sets up a layer of H3O2 before it and it restructures. And that now is Mark Leclerc's work at MIT on cold fusion. It is an example of cold fusion in the movement of a wave which moves faster than the wave itself moves because of the structure and nature of memory in water. Now, with that said, now we have different kinds of water that we're drinking. If you drink ice water, for example, most all of that water goes right straight into the bladder. It yeah. doesn't go into the body. If you drink room temperature water, that water is more easily assimilated by your body because it has to heat it up in order to get into the crust of the cell wall. And then you have, let's say, an electrolyte, like a lemon squeeze. That electrolyte changes the pH, so you're able to assume, assimilate it better. Um, I remember... That's what we learned when we were cutting wheat in Pullman during the summers. We get really, really hot. You do not want to drink beer because it gets you stoned out of your mind, drunk, you know. And what the farmer would always do is around three o'clock in the afternoon, when the heat was getting up, we still had another four or five hours of wheat cutting. He would come in with big buckets of water with full of lemon, and we would drink that to rehydrate ourselves properly. And one of the things I did when I was a SEAL was train in homeopathy where you carry a small vial of baking soda. And what you do is a single drop of baking soda in water, a glass of water, will completely restructure it in terms of the way the body will assimilate it. And so that's Rustam Roy at Penn State that did those studies. It's um, the material and studies are out there. It's sifting through the debris and trying to find the gems that get to the place where, you know, we now have a model that allows us to understand better what water really is and what it is not. Imagine how very tiny water is. It is six zeros smaller than gallium and arsenic that they put together to form a computer chip, which is the boundary between the two in gallium and arsenic, gallium arsenide, that will be what you call the forbidden zone. And so the um, structured water is called the exclusion zone and is a similar computer storage interface, which is six zeros more efficient. Wow. As a computer. That's mind blowing. Well, I'm just trying to, okay, this is where we're going in our sciences. It's extremely exciting yes, to realize, yeah. yeah, the possibilities yeah. of where, yeah, yeah. So, Next um, question. <laughs> I mean, Richard, I can't, I can't, I can't thank you enough for joining me here. Is there, uh, is there something we could do as a collective uh, to? Broaden our horizons more as the, uh, because you you know the divide in our society right now. Yeah. yeah. How do we deal with that? Kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Blue hairs unite all. Uh, you know the Grinnells of the universe. Um, the Buddhists have used sound 
to move large objects. The Tibetan Buddhists, they have these big long horns like they do in the Alps. And what it does is those low frequencies cause air to compress and they start to oscillate. And when they do, they're incompressible and can lift large stones just using them. And so from that point of view, you could suggest that the Bible was written as a book of science mm -hmm. using religion as opposed to science. It, it talks about the Sefer Yetzera, the book of formation, relating sound to words. And there the Buddhists are doing it. These are technologies we don't have in our society. Mm -hmm. And yet the Bible is rife with example. Of, if you say the name of God correctly, uh, vibratory levels, things happen. That science is what we call resonant cavity oscillation. And how one subset of hierarchies communicate to the next one up and down, as above, so below. And your gut is exhibit A and is outside space time. It is outside space time. Uh, if you talk about statistical events and quantum consciousness, you're limited to where you can go with that mm -hmm. in terms of Eisenberg. And uh, whereas in a holographic system, as Hermes, others have projected or suggested, they've had different names in different epochs. That talks about information where the Egyptians talk about the Hadith and Nuit, the, the vast expanse of ever, infinity and the point. And the point was she had it because she knew it. <laughs> or incommensurability, it's, right? Well, <laughs> it's the way of polarizing one thing to another. And that's John Bohm. That's, he was 10 years later when he did his implicate order uh, talking about different similarities and similar differences. The way you would chunk down your meme. Uh, you know, looking at one level to the next and so on. Like if you turn it higher, and then you had the wheel, then you had the lug nuts, and then you had the, you know. How one, how one relates to the other. Now, you, when you were speaking there, you, you, uh, you made me think of your paper. I was reading your resonant paper that you sent me. And uh, you said something about the blue light and its uh, ability to to get us into a state of uh, uh, well, in the boot in the Bordeaux at all that. I, thank you, Ben Gardner. <laughs> um, he uh, uh, in the Bordeaux at all, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. They say that man has one last choice at the moment of death. And uh, Kubler-Ross, others have talked about that. The tunnel of light, with all your friends waving, come on in, the water's fine, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, which is very reminiscent of a birth canal coming back <laughs> into this universe. Is that why we come out screaming? <laughs> and then they talk about getting off the wheel and going back to God. Mm -hmm. And that is the blue light. It's you just gave me goosebumps, man. I'm serious. My hair is standing on end right now. <laughs> I, it, I didn't mean to do that. No, I call it true, my truth meter. You know, oh. that's what I call it. Well, the Buddhists, I'll bet you that that space, that crash spacecraft on the other side of the moon is probably Buddhist. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But Aborigines, for example, did Kobeki Tempe uh, and let me tell you that went underground about the Hopi when they call the Clovis that they're unearthly now. They're saying my internet is again unstable. I get these little signs up there telling me I'm about to lose myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the idea that we've been here before is something that we all sense is sort of real that our society you go to the cave of dreams in in france and they have this bison on the wall 
and the bison looks like it was painted by a caveman, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but upon closer inspection, you'll notice that the dots around the eye is precisely a star map. Oh, goosebumps. Then you go further down into toward Croatia, and they have the same drawings, except the star map is in reverse, indicating it was witnessed from space. And yes. the Elvis culture that they're now unearthing down near uh, 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 Popo, the big volcano and all of that, is this massive city, way bigger than New York City. And the structures are indicating that they had space travel. Yeah. And, and yet, that culture, Clovis, crawled out of a cave to mm -hmm. become the Hopi. So the red and blue Kuchina that they talk about is very remindful of a red shift, of something going through our solar system so quickly, there's no warning. And, um, you know, blue and red Kuchina. I, metaphor, always in metaphor, that's Gregory Bateson. Um, he was, I took a course from him at Berkeley. He, he said that, what is your metaphor, but to serve your paradox. So of course I have a meadow with a pair of ox out in it. As I'm at, to try to represent it to ox, nose to nose, one is white, one is black, mm -hmm. in a meadow. What is your metaphor, but to serve your paradox. Very good. <laughs> Very good. That, 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 you could get lost in that thought forever. <laughs> well, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what a metaphor does. It causes you to think. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what you need to do because that's where the richness of thought becomes imagination. And going from the profane into the sacred now becomes timeless and becomes real. Wonderful. Hey, Richard, thank you, man. I really appreciate you joining me. And uh, I'd like to have you on again, if, if you would. Oh, and, I, my pleasure. You ask good questions, so. though. Is, <laughs> is there anything you'd like to stump for? or uh, uh, yeah, Support my starving artist mode. <laughs> I have lots of books. I have lots of audio books. I just came out with my 10th audio book in metaphysics. I taught metaphysics for 11 years at Harvard. I had 15 courses, eight weeks each. And what I'm doing on my website is I'm offering uh, a free download library of rare manuscripts that I use in the metaphysics to lecture and so that you can go to the old books I quote from and make your own conclusions. Metaphysics means beyond physics. That's what we should be teaching our children. Earth, air, fire, and water. The playground starting with a garden first, then structured water, having the concept of a child learning what water is and what it is not. I am taking a thing out here called the caterpillar that has an entomology thing on the monarch butterfly, and it goes around to the grade schools, teaches the first graders about you know migration of the insect. What I want to do is put a water testing laboratory in that where children right out of the gate know how to determine the turbidity and pH of water and knowing whether it's drinkable or not. You and I as adults don't even know how to do that. And a child, huh. and you let a third grader show a first grader how to do it, and all we do is provide the microscope. Wonderful. Let them teach us how to do it. That's a wonderful concept. That's wonderful, Richard. It, yeah. <laughs> That's all I can say. Children well. Yeah, I know. It resonates. We'll call this one Common Ground, where they have a playground with growing seeds and watching the way water changes the plant and makes it grow. Um, I, I like Cloud Atlas, that movie, where the kids teach each other, and what an adult is for is to facilitate and provide the tools that the child then, what, like you, are like a millennial. You're extremely bright, and you're not as practical as you need to. Boy, you know how to thumb wrestle really good. 
<laughs> you know? <laughs> well, no, I mean, um, I wouldn't want to thumb wrestle you. I'll bet you could take me, and even straight sets. Uh, but the practicality, the way I try to teach it or indicate it is a this kid runs into his father and said, Dad, something's wrong with the truck. Yeah, I can't get it to drive over 20 miles an hour. And the dad says, well, let's see what's wrong. And puts the key in, releases the brake, and the truck drives fine. And the kid turns around and said, what did you just do? <laughs> I wouldn't want to see you try to change the oil in the truck. That could be a creepy example of what it I mean, you know, yeah, I, I know you know how to do that. That's what I'm discovering is nobody's practical anymore. Mm -hmm. And it isn't about high tech. It's about chopping water and carrying wood. Oh, carrying wood. Chop, wood. <laughs> uh, chop wood, carry water. Uh, yeah, one of those things. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. My pleasure, sir. I really appreciate you coming on my show and you like, uh, like, uh, I don't know. I, I really love your concept and your outlook, and I ho only wish everybody else had the same outlook as you do. Well, it's, and, it's a growing thing. You are just a part of the movement, and I am just one lead scout. And what I'm doing is leaving books in my wake for you to write your better one. And, uh, you know, a succession of, of concepts moving mankind as a whole toward uh, better levels of awareness and consciousness. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Richard. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. You have a nice day. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.